Let's go to inflation. That inflation data out today, it's fallen from 7.4, which were the numbers in January, these come out every month, to 6.8% today. Now, hopefully that bodes well for the upcoming RBA meeting, which of course is Tuesday. Joining me now, economist and business writer with News Corp, Terry McCran. Terry, please give us some uh, insight. Where do you think uh, the RBA might be on Tuesday, given what we think and see is this fall in, in, in inflation? Well, short answer, Peter, two short answers. One, yes, inflation did peak in the December quarter. Uh, those numbers indicate that very clearly. Uh, and yes, the RBA will pause when we get that uh, rate decision next Tuesday. But there are two buts, unfortunately, in all this. All the factors that were driving inflation in 2022, the sort of overflow from the COVID period, the supply disruptions, the problems with getting actually getting product, the war in Ukraine, the rising energy prices, all that has peaked, at least as so far as those factors were driving things. Uh, but, but we've now got to move to our own homegrown challenges. And one is we're going to get another round of energy price increases, totally homegrown, nothing to do with Ukraine, nothing to do with the world world energy situation uh, come June and July. And secondly, the really big worry is what happens to wages. Every month when Reserve Bank Governor Philip Lowe has been announcing his decisions, he said, we're on a very narrow path. And the one thing, the one thing that will cause us to fall off that path is if we actually start to see wages rising by significantly more than 3% a year. That's about as much as we can we can accommodate, 3% a year. Now, we've had a, the election yeah. of a government in New South Wales which says we want to, we're going to get rid of the 3% ceiling on 500,000 public servants in New South Wales. That's really an invitation mm -hmm. for them to chase and get wage increases of 4% or more. And we've now got the Albanese federal government saying they're going to go for a wait, a full compensation for inflation wage increase for 2 million plus workers on the minimum wage. So if we actually start to see wages rising by 4 to 5% or more a year, that inflation pause will be short-lived and that rate pause that we're going to get next week will also be short-lived. You would have heard me just then discuss the, the 650,000 migrants this year and next year. I mean, these are record levels. This, this is bigger than, as I said, Kevin Rudd's big Australia push uh, in 08, 09. It's like the country in terms of population is a snake. And this is the best way I can explain it to people at home. And the snake has got a basketball coming through its belly. Now, we already know uh, people can't get rental properties. We already know with pressure, particularly those that are coming off their fixed mortgage rates, um, they, they've just got their head above water because they have a job. You throw all these extra workers into the mix, maybe their hours might get cut, they don't get their uh, overtime, or God forbid they lose their job. This is going to be quite uh, difficult to manage, Terry. Well, absolutely, Peter. I mean, in the short run, it's a plus so far as inflation and wages go, because business out there is desperate for workers for all sorts of reasons that they we've got a massive shortfall in supply of workers pretty much across the workforce. So this sort of immigration mm -hmm. inflow will prevent, to some extent, that wages bubble that I was talking about. But as you indicate, Peter, they, these workers actually coming in, these new migrants, will actually want to be part of our community. They will actually add to demand, and not just for their personal demand, but for all the services that governments are required to provide, all the infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera. So in the short run, yes, it might take some of the heat out of wages pressure, inflation pressure, but long run, it's all those issues that you've raised will just keep bubbling back to the surface. All right, let's, uh, let's go to this uh, comment. Just before I came on air, I was listening to uh, the head of Bowen Coking Coal, Nick Jorce. He was speaking with Sherry Marks and, and uh, I was doing my hair and makeup and my ears pricked up at this comment he made. Have a listen. These targets are, are, are I think, unachievable. Um, you know, we've seen what's happened in other jurisdictions like Germany where they've moved, frankly, too fast uh, towards renewables. Uh, their costs are some of the highest in the world for their electricity. We've got enough 
cost of living pressure here in Australia as it is, and we don't want to, we don't want to add to that. We don't need to make ourselves less competitive and, and, and lose more jobs. He's absolutely well, right, brutally, isn't he, Terry? Well, exactly. It's brutally clear, Peter, that this mad rush to renewables, particularly in the context of this massive increase in population, is just total insanity. I mean, you know, putting aside the basic insanity of both just thinking we can solve all our economic problems by bringing in four or 500,000 migrants a year, increasing over the years, and secondly, that we can go so rapidly to get rid of all the reliable sources of power. When you put the two together, a massive increase in population, all of which demands electricity, uh, and destroying our, our sensible electricity system and embracing very expensive alternatives is just a recipe for, A, massive continual increases in price if we can actually get the electricity mm. when we touch that switch. There's a term called scope three emissions. And it's really important my viewers understand this. There's discussion about the Beetaloo Basin project being world first. Uh, this will all be to ensure the project's net zero. It's a huge project for Australia. But Terry, explain what they mean by scope three emissions. Well, scope three emissions, very simply, Peter, are the emissions that are generated or emitted when the coal is actually used by the end user. Now, so that makes us responsible for the emissions that, that are going to be emitted in the countries that are using our coal, in India, in China, and so on. And it's a risk by, by making us responsible for it and requiring us to reduce them. It basically means we're going to destroy any ability to have a new coal mine or indeed a gas a gas field going forward. So this is a recipe, an indirect process, but it is clearly very mm. emphatic that it will stop any new coal mines if we actually go down this down this path. And just let me jump in there. Of course, you know, China will buy its coal from Indonesia. Indonesia won't apply scope three emissions. Indonesia exactly. won't take in a, into account in Indonesia, the emissions in China, we're the only mugs will do something. We'll pat ourselves on the back and say it's a world first, aren't we fabulous? But we'll run ourselves nothing, into the ground. And it does nothing for global emissions. It just means that we get impoverished and the, the, the total emissions in the world continue to grow unabated. You cannot make this stuff up, Terry McCran. Thank you for your time.